Hello and welcome to the Summit on Content Marketing. I am your host, Alan Sharp, and I am pleased to introduce Andy Kapiloff. Andy is the Chief Operating Officer of Curati, and he's going to tell us what that is in a minute. In his previous life, Andy was an IT programmer and a business analyst in the financial services sector. And it's there that he picked up his love of research and writing. And one of the hats that Andy wears at Curati is fashioning the blog strategy and also managing the various bloggers and inquiries that they receive. And in his capacity as a COO, Andy has been exposed to the best and the worst blogging practices that there are. And uh, Andy's now embarking on teaching his findings to others within the broader context of content strategy. So naturally, Andy is talking to us today about blogging blunders and how to avoid them. Welcome, Andy, to the Summit on Content Marketing. Thank you, Alan. And I'm very, very happy to have been asked to speak or be interviewed it's a great honor. Some wonderful, wonderful other speakers at this summit. So definitely, um, definitely very happy to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. So why don't we start right back, right at the beginning, Andy, and, and talk about what makes for a good blogger? What does make for a good blogger? Well, um, t unique style uh, and People have to be able to break break free of the norms because you know to say that the there are there's a lot of content out there is a little bit passe by now everyone knows it but to be good you have to stand out and you're not going to stand out if there isn't something that is different about the way that you um, that you write. So, um, and, then, and another thing is, of course, you have to understand what the end goal is. The end goal is some form of conversion, even if as a guest blogger, perhaps, that conversion is getting people to come to your site or getting more followers. Um, and and you, you just have to give people a reason to read your stuff instead of, a thousand other articles that are likely to be on an extraordinarily similar sounding topic. Hmm. That brings up uh, a good issue, and that is that uh, there are thousands of articles, billions of articles online, and there are lots of articles written on the same topic or very close. So how can a would-be blogger, somebody who wants to be successful at blogging and get a following, uh, what is there that they can do or what is it that they can say uh, if what they want to say has already been said in many other ways, in many other places? Yeah, well, um, start with the negative first. Um, I, I, was, I was driven so crazy by the list articles um, and you should use this app and this app and this app and every one of them or 90% of them mentioned Hemingway app. I'm sure Hemingway app is great, and I'm sure that the people who use it absolutely love it, but there is a limit to how many articles it needs to be mentioned in, and certainly a limit to how many articles um, any one blog needs to, uh, needs to publish with it or similar apps mentioned in. So that harks back to the, the first question. But you need to introduce different aspects in, in, um, in your content. You need to change the sequence a little bit. You need to, you need your own turn of phrase. You need something. Um, I, I mean, I know that this kind of sounds similar to the answer to question one, but you have to have something that, that makes it seem as if it's different, even if it necessarily isn't. And that's something, that ingredient is you, the blogger, and, and the way your mind works, the way you analyze things. Just bring something else in that no one else has thought of. So it, it sounds like you're talking about uh, the, the voice of the blogger, the unique voice. H how can people, especially if they're new to blogging, or even new to writing, how can they discover their 
unique voice or even develop it? You have to get into the way that you talk. Um, I, there are a few quotes that, that I have appreciated as I've read them. And one of them is David, David Ogilvy saying, write the way you talk naturally. And then um, Bob Sawyer has a book that says, write like you talk, only better. Um, and, and that's really, I mean, that, that's a very, very big thing, isn't it? Because I can't, if I were to write the way I'm talking now, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to chop out a number of things to make it so that people would actually read, right? So um, and Elmore Leonard said, if it sounds like writing, rewrite it. So, again, it's a conversational minus the natural waffle, which is what you're hearing from me right now. <laughs> um, be, be, be more concise without the word repetition and the laziness and things like absolutely and, and whatever else you use to punctuate your spoken language that all of your friends and relatives will know you for. Chop those things out. They're not necessary. Um, and you have a chance to correct your poor English, um, especially if you're a non-native speaker. You, you definitely have a chance to correct the, the, the mistakes that you would speak with. Um, and and um, just con convey your true voice. And you, you can't do that if your writing sounds nothing like you. Gotcha. So you're advising people to be unique, but I, I gather from a blog post of yours that you're not impressed with writers who say uh, that you need to be authentic in your writing. Um, why don't you talk about that for a minute, your, your, your opinion of authenticity in blogging? My opinion of authenticity is that you can only write if you are authentic. Um, but my opinion of articles that tell people how to be authentic, well, um, maybe I'm doing them a disservice by never having read one, but the title itself drives me crazy because authentic means genuine. And I don't know how anyone can tell me or you or anyone else to be genuine. It's, it's about being who you are. So... As I said, you tap into yourself um, and then you convey that. And only you can know how to do that. You shouldn't need an article. Once you start confusing things by reading articles on telling you how to be you, you're going to lose that essence and you're not going to be you. Ignore the articles. Just be yourself. That reminds me of a famous uh, quote from Laurence Olivier, the the method actor, he said, once you can fake authenticity, you have it made. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, well, um, I, I think I'm sure that there are people out there who do fake authenticity, and I'm sure that some of those get away with it and people think that they really are genuine. Um, and I'm sure that those of us who think that we can spot it miss it sometimes. So... You know, perhaps there's a case for it if you are uh, Laurence Olivier, by all means, go ahead and, and fake it. But for most of us, I think that that's kind of a, a tough call and we should we should stick with just being our true selves. Right. Now, on your blog, you, you've also mentioned uh, what you call second level communicators. That might be a, a, a unique phrase a new phrase for some people. But could you tell us what you mean by second-level communicators? Well, um, a second-level communicator is the person that takes what the thought leaders are saying or takes something that, um, that, is, that is a very, very high level, maybe, um, maybe some new innovation, and adds the context to it. it, it so it, it's really just a term around something that people know anyway. But 
you add a context to it and you uh, and you write it for your audience because the things that I, I'm very very careful not to mention names because I don't want to miss out any others and there are so many people who I respect I'm, I'm not going dis- you know I'm not going to do a disservice to the, to some by not mentioning while I mention others but we know who we listen to we know who we read <clears throat> but we also know that our own audience wouldn't necessarily read those people wouldn't necessarily be interested in doing so or get everything that they're saying so it's for us to take their leadership thoughts or to take what is in the news and present it to to the next level uh, um so then we are the second level communicators we don't invent things to say um we might come up with a little uh, with our new with our own slant but we're not inventing anything new to say so um it's a uh, it's something that's the that is a, a useful service that all of us are probably already doing for our for our unique niches it's called context you know context content is king and context is queen or whatever however that goes this is all about context so the, it sounds like the value that the the second level communicators bring to their audience is that they can take a, an idea that's being championed by a thought leader, a, a first level communicator, and they're able to give it context or explain it in layman's terms. Would that be would that be accurate? That's exactly right. In it, but in different layman's terms, because if you are in manufacturing, then your idea of the Internet of Things is going to be different to if you're in insurance or some other field. So it's about taking exactly the same innovation or news um, or, or or thought leadership from someone else and presenting it in the way that your audience can read, in a way that it makes a difference to their lives. Because this is all about your audience so yes you get excited about something that you read and you want to write about it but if you write about it the way you read it it might not resonate with your audience so you change it to fit your audience why do your audience come to you so you know turn this new story into something that that they can really grasp and they can also get excited about right so you talked about writing that resonates with your audience, and uh, Curati, which is the the website that you write for, is a it's a bl- essentially it's a blog, but it's a blog with multiple dozens of authors, and uh, I imagine that you get inquiries from would be contributors to your blog uh, that are, for one reason or another are not a good fit. So uh, could you tell us about some of the warning signs that you look for in a submission from a blogger that lets you know that it's it's not a good fit for curati and and by implication uh help our our readers underst- our listeners understand some of the warning signs for what is not a good blog post period okay well um talking about a completely different niche so we're b to b if you write something that is 100% retail or 100% manufacturing, then it's a bit of a tall order for, for us to publish it. Now, sometimes there is, if an article is strong enough, I can take it back to someone and say, if you change this or this and you bring in a little B2B um, accent to it, then maybe we can use it. But, you you definitely have to know the um, the niche or the general audience of the blog that you're looking to write for, um, and a part of that niche is understanding the the experience level. So we tend to be for more experience more experienced people come to us. It, this is just the way it happened. It wasn't the way it was necessarily intended. 
but we can't start writing, uh, start posting beginners level um, articles. And we do get a lot of very enthusiastic young or just beginner bloggers who um, who are learning their trade and they've been published on a few blogs and they send me their stuff and they send me some some content suggestions and it is all things that we did three years ago um, and and even then a lot of our readers you know it was already nothing to them you know I mean they've seen it all before so you you have to know your niche you have to know your audience and it, it's I mean I I'm sure that I'll be talking about this more as we go along but research don't just blindly go in with enthusiasm and say I can. I want to write for Curati. I want to write for this blog, for your blog, whatever it is, without having researched what the blog is, what level it is. Are you there yet? Because you might get you might get there. You might, and we're actually very very happy to help people who are close. But if you're not close, then you know, then then that's too big a project. Right. So, what are some what are some other things that, that make a, a blog post or, or a proposed post stand out as being uh, inadequate? Uh, I'm thinking of the phrases, the words that, uh, that people use in blog posts that they should avoid. Can you give any advice on that, the kind of writing style? Uh, um, you've got to write to a broad audience. Don't presume that everyone is your age group because they're not. Um, it's very clear from from the people who submit to us that we have a lot of 20-somethings, but we also have some 50-somethings and beyond. So um, although although we did actually publish one article that had on fleek in it, it's, I don't even know if people know what that means or um, if it, if, if people using it stick with the original meaning, it, it, I don't get it, honestly. I mean, you know, um, for me, that's one of the words that I would kind of like to see avoided or one of the phrases now more than ever. Now more than ever, 99 percent of the time I've seen it. Whatever followed it has proven those words to be irrelevant. Um, the word multiple is one of the most overused words right now these days again just like now more than ever no it's not these days it's always people have always said these days and it's almost always been a completely irrelevant phrase and um, how about in 2017 and then you go on to talk about something that was big in 2016 and maybe in 2012 and will be big next year also. Don't date what you're talking about. If you date it, then you limit the the life of your content. So, um, you know, like putting 2017 in a title. We're at, we're almost at May now. I'm still I, I'm still getting people sending stuff to us on an almost daily basis, saying blah 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 in 2017. And it's not relevant. We all know what year it is. And, you know, by now it just is. We don't have to mention the year. January, February, yes, sure. Looking forward to next year. To, um, looking forward to 2018 at the end of this year or a retrospective on 2017 in the last couple of months. Fine, mention the year. But all of this stuff with mentioning years, it, it's overdone. It's not necessary. It dates it, it dates your article. It limits its life. And if you are looking at, uh, at a blog title in two years' time that says whatever, and then in 2017, then unless someone's looking for historical perspective, 
why do they need to open your article? You're doing yourself a disservice. It might be a great article, and people are only going to click on it this year. Right. Any other things that people should avoid? Any other uh, redundancies or oxymorons? Uh, um, just shameless newsjacking. You know, um, I really I don't like it when when people use, let's say, a, a natural disaster um, to to talk about marketing lessons or the annual Super Bowl articles um, or um, you know talking about talking about the the lessons that a B two B marketer can learn from Pokemon. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know that I that I'm looking to gain marketing lessons from cartoon characters, from damage by a storm, um, Super Bowl. I mean, they've been at it for years. Of course, they can teach you things, but but why do you have to write about it every January or February? It's it, you know, it, it's really not necessary. I, I mean, to me. I just ignore all of those things. But more than Super Bowl, the, the, the shameless news jacking. Like, uh, and I also don't want to read about things to be learned from the last election for marketing. You know, we, we, we had enough on the election when it was happening. We don't, need to, <laughs> we don't need to talk about it in our marketing. I agree. I, I've got a favorite redundancy. Um, it's when people use the word different to modify something that by its very nature has to be different. So they'll talk about 12 different countries well, <laughs> yes. or, or, or five different colors. Well, you know, if there are five colors, they must be different, right? <laughs> because yes. colors by definition, if they're plural, they must be different, right? Yeah, uh, I can hear my brother's voice in my head right now. Um, one of his pet peeves is when people talk about the most unique. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> if it's unique, there is most is redundant. Yeah, there aren't gradations so of uniqueness, right? On its own, so it can't. It, you can't be more unique than something else. You're either unique or you're not unique. Yeah. That so means, yeah, there are many redundancies. Another, I like that. Another one is the word completely. I, they use it on the radio a lot here. They'll talk about the the local highway if there's a traffic jam, and they'll say the left lane is completely blocked. Well, if it's blocked, it's completely blocked, right? Or they'll say a house was completely destroyed when they could simply say <laughs> it was destroyed, <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. I, I think, you know what? I'm sure I'm guilty of that one also. I hope not in my written... You know, that, that goes back to one of the earlier questions. I hope I'm not guilty of it in my written work, but I'm sure I'm guilty of it in my spoken language. Um, yeah, that, that, that's one of the ways that you go and edit and, and make your and make your writing the way you talk, but better. Absolutely. Are there any other practices that that you frown on, Andy, that you see on a regular basis? Oh, I'm sure, there are many, um, but what will come to mind? Um, what about swearing? Uh, I know oh. some. I know some bloggers like to swear. It's kind of their voice, their their style. What do you think swearing, about? If that is how they made their name, and um, people know them for it, and um, that's who their audience is, and their audience loves them for it, then I've got nothing against it. But don't import that into a broader audience. Um, I suppose there are people who like to criticize certain practices um, and by all means, again, do that to your own audience. But when you take it to a broader audience, it can maybe come off as sounding a bit mean, um, even when it wasn't intended, because you think you're talking to friends. But, you know, social media, you start off talking to friends and you end up talking to the world. So you have to be a bit careful. No matter no matter how you made your name, um, if you can if you can keep those certain practices among friends, then by all means. If you can keep them to your small audience, by all means. 
But once the audience starts to grow or, or once the platforms start to grow, then you you don't you don't want people to be turned off by that. Or maybe you don't care if a few people are. But you definitely, I don't think, should want to be seen as being mean spirited. So, um yeah, be be careful with uh, with with criticizing things, especially if people know what you're referring to and maybe have an idea of who it might be that you're really talking about, even if you didn't mention a name. You know, keep the feuds keep the feuds where they belong and out of the public, because you know you you. You can look at the you can look at uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, and you know that 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 was something that was a feud that should have been private and became very very public. And one of them saying all sorts of horrible things. And who does everyone side with? Not the person who said all of the horrible things, right? Right. So be careful. That's all. Right. Now. Er- a few minutes ago, you were mentioning that one of the mistakes you see people making as potential bloggers is they pitch ideas to you that are business to consumer, and you're a business to business blog, and they just they 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 I almost said they totally make a mistake, but that would be redundant. They <laughs> they 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 miss they miss that right, so they don't understand your audience. So, what advice do you have for bloggers in how they can understand their audience? And, and write accordingly? Well, they should certainly understand their own audience, but um, let's, just, let's just for a moment presume that maybe some don't. They're just, they're just finding their feet. They're new at this. So you've got social media um, accounts. People talk to you. On your blog, perhaps, or hopefully people will leave a a rare comment, even if that's not done very frequently, people will leave comments. So you just you want to know who it is who's out there who's really listening. And and you you will need to if it's on your own blog, you need to talk to the audience that have gathered around you and understand that it may not be who you initially thought it would be. You may not, you may aim at one audience and and different people will come, um, as happened with Girati. I'm sure that we are not unique on this. Uh, And I I avoided adding any words before unique. You did. Uh, Yes, yes. On guard. Yes, (laughs) very much on guard. (laughs) You've got me thinking about these things right now. Um, And if it's on someone else's blog, likewise, you're not talking to your own audience this time or you're not talking to the audience that you think that you probably have. So check it out first. Understand who it is that you're talking to. Maybe they send you some guidelines. Read the guidelines. They're useful. You know, um, I sent I sent some guidelines to someone recently, and then they came back with things. Do you think that it showed that they read the guidelines? No. So it's a waste of time. You know, do yourself a favor, read the guidelines, do some research, know who you're talking to. If it's your own blog, just be open to who you're talking to, not being who you thought it might be when you started. Right. I gather you've got some opinions about articles that are structured around uh, numbers. You know, the the top five of this, five ways to do so-and-so, ten ten mistakes to avoid. They're called listicles, a word I hate. But um, an article that's essentially a list, a a numbered list. What are your thoughts on those? Well, um, they are – they're very popular, and they can't be avoided, and so much research – shows us that the it's necessary i mean they they, they get greater um they get greater readership get greater click throughs more comments so you you have to go with them but um don't rehash everything from the, the lists i know i mentioned earlier about the about the lists of apps 
don't use the same apps. Don't don't do everything that you've read before or do a list of 10 things and seven of them are in all of the other lists of 10 things and you just add three. And when it comes to things that you must do for your blog, there is no one size fits all approach. So for years now, I have always mentally added if you have 10 things that you must do to build your website or to build your audience, in my mind, there's always been number 11. There no size fits all. There is nothing that you can tell that works for everyone. So please, to, to everyone who's reading these things, take nothing absolutely for granted. If something doesn't sound like it will work for you, maybe you're being overcautious. Maybe it's that you just don't understand the relevance to you. But maybe it's because it really isn't a fit for you. And just because it was good for someone else, it might be very, very bad for you. So, you know, no one size fits all. I, I can't say that often enough. All right. What about... Uh the boundaries for blog content. Uh, should all blogs keep their published content within very strict boundaries? That's that's a yes or no question. So it's, I pretend that it was an open-ended question. Uh, um, well, I, I, you, you see the, the graphic that I chose for this one. Um, there is... It's different for everyone, is what it comes down to. You know, again, no one size fits all. So what are your reasons for blogging? Um, if, if your niche or uh, your trade requires that you have very, very specific boundaries, then by all means, stick to those boundaries. But if you're in something that is ever-changing like the digital marketplace, then you can't stick within strict boundaries because it will just, it, it will leave you in its wake. You're going to be a dinosaur before you know it. So, yeah, um, definitely, definitely look at your own specific business and reason for doing this and the answer should be there for you. All right, let, let's change direction here. Uh, you were talking earlier on about how, how difficult it is to write content that is original because so much has already been published. And I, I don't remember the, the statistic now, but it's, it's just a mind-boggling statistic, the number of blog posts and tweets and Facebook updates and videos that are uploaded online every day. Uh, people are overwhelmed with the amount of content. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, we were talking about overwhelm years ago, and then you add in the the um, that I see in so many articles about how content doubles every year. So if we if we were overwhelmed three years ago, then does that make us overwhelmed by two to the power of three? What is that? Eight times more overwhelmed than we were um, three years ago. Well. Hopefully not, because hopefully we've we've developed tools for for dealing with it. Um, but really, when it comes to your own um, when it comes to your own content, you have to think in terms of that overwhelm, and you have to you you have to imagine that when you are when you're the consumer. There are so many things that you won't read, you won't look at. So write, the, write your articles based upon what you wouldn't read. And again, still always know, always, always just temper that very, very slightly as you must for what you, what you already know your audience will read. But... Yeah, it's something that you cannot be unaware of in within your content strategy. So 
What do you consider uh, exactly when deciding what to read or share? Well, uh, what will be useful to me, um, what my readers, what our readers um, want to see, what they've shown that they will, that they want to see. Um, is there a trend that is just really interesting that goes beyond anything that we're that we've written before? Is there a, a slight tangent from something that that is commonly written about that maybe we can inject something new into? Um, that that's in terms of the sharing, in terms of the reading. Does it just, just does it grab me as different? It's not the same old, same old um, that probably has its place for people who haven't been doing this for years but, you know, aren't going to grab my attention. So, yeah, definitely it's, it's got to be useful to you and your audience. That's the bottom line. Right. Let's talk about uh, curated content. Uh, could you just define curated content, in particular curated articles or curated uh, blog posts, and uh, tell us your thoughts on them? Well, um, there have been there have been schools of thought on curation, and some people aggregate content, um, and it, it is a form of curation. Um, curating can also be grabbing any number of different articles and pulling them into one larger umbrella. Um, you know, think about, think about a library, think about a museum. We all do this, but um, curation is, um, it, it, curation is about bringing in the thoughts of others, the work of others, and creating an umbrella for them, uh, creating a home for them. It's very, very loose, but without getting into the, the finer details, um, that's what I think of when I think of curate. Uh, if, if we had a curated website, then it's really about bringing in all of the works of others, either individually or, or grouping them together in subjects. So you're categorizing things. Right. And, and how does that... Are, are there any blunders to avoid? Our, our topic here is blogging blunders. Are there blunders to avoid when it comes to curating content? Well, um, you... You have to. You, you, you don't want to just say everything that was said originally, because you make it you make it unnecessary for people to to read what you're saying. Unless you become a hub for people who don't want to read uh, a thousand articles and would rather read your fifty articles, and certainly there's a place for that. You and even then, you want to present it in a way that is interesting to people. So it, it, it always comes back to the same things, doesn't it? You, you have to inject something new. You have to capture people's interest in a certain way. And if you fail to do that, then people are just going to look elsewhere and find that elsewhere. Right. So let's talk about blogging blunders in particular and if you had to list them, name them, number them, what are uh, some of the things you consider some of the worst practices today in 2017 when it comes to blogging? Well, uh, I'll, I'll go back and I'll say that this was relevant last year and the year before also. Um, but you don't want to make people work too hard to read your post. So run on sentences insufficient use of commas people are people have very very limited bandwidth and uh limited attention spans and unless they're just really skimming and a lot of people are 
if you make them work to understand a sentence that goes on for three or four lines, and, you know, you could read it 20 times and come up with 20 different ways of reading it, they're just going to bounce out. They're not, they're not going to bother with you. So that's one of the things. Don't make people work. Um, another one, and this is kind of giving away a little bit of a secret here, but maybe it's not a secret to everyone. There are some people who it's very, very clear don't have English as their first language, but they adopt an English name. Um, English sounding name and then they write in their English as a second language way and they're not fooling people it's not far rather you have a non-English sounding name if your if your English isn't very good and then people will give you a pass because they expect you you know you their English is way better than your whatever language um, Russian, Indian, whatever, Italian, their language, their English is way better than your, uh, than your grasp of their language. They will give you a pass. Adopt an English name and you are judged by the higher standard. So I would advise people not to do that. But there are the other things of the people who probably are actually native English speakers and were born in the USA or the UK or I don't know if Canada is as bad, but there are Americans and, uh, and Brits whose English is just awful. Um, and they, they write as if it's their second language, but it isn't. So... You know, you, you, you have to know how you have to know how to write. You, you can't speak like it. You can't write like a foreigner if you're not one or if your name suggests that you're not one. All right. Any, um, other, any other blunders yeah, that you're yeah. seeing? Writing basic hints. If you're saying here are 10 things that you that you need, 10 tools for visual marketing, then give us some visuals. Don't just give us text and if you're writing about videos then give us a video show us a demonstration you know uh walk the walk that you talk don't don't just don't talk about something and not demonstrate it all right any others yeah um don't talk about how to gain a massive following if you've got a hundred twitter followers That, that you you have to be able to demonstrate what you're talking about. Right. You know, we all get those things. I mean, how, if you're on if you're on Instagram, it's really really annoying, and I block them immediately. Um, but it, you know, you could do this. You could do this in a blog post also. But the people who are trying to sell you uh, a foolproof way of getting you know a gazillion followers for free or for a certain amount of money and then when you're going to block them they've got 16 followers well you know no wonder. not that i'm going to sign up anyway but but if you had a gazillion followers maybe you're doing something right yeah what about the other side of the coin to to use the cliche which is something we should avoid in our writing uh yeah, most <laughs> But fun, you can add one sometimes. We should avoid cliches like the plague. Um, <laughs> what about best practices in blogging? Uh, what would you say are some of the best practices? Well, it all starts with the research yet again. Um, and you must always hyperlink sources. People who mention a survey or a source and don't hyperlink them drives me crazy, you know, um, because they, because now I don't know if there's a genuine source or if you just made it up. So give yourself some credibility and and hyperlink those great sources that you got this from. 
show us some charts if they're relevant. When you see there are there are some people, and two two are coming to mind immediately. Again, mentioning no names, who are so amazing with their use of charts that you look at their articles and the charts tell a story, and and the writing is is embellishment and some some great explanation and teaching but as soon as you look at those charts you know that you're looking at something good so um also eye-popping but yet relevant images you don't want to put in images that have nothing to do with what uh with what you're writing about just for the sake of breaking up your your content even though there is something to be said for breaking up content if you if you don't have charts to go there um, or, or some other illustration it's always it, you should definitely look to not have 1500 words uh, of straight text not many people's eyes can handle that without glazing over uh, you you have to be the most amazing writer and some people can carry it but most of us can't Right. So, good images, avid proofreading. So, this is something that's almost impossible to get 100% right, and I don't care if you use Grammarly or another tool. Um, you're still going to miss certain things, and if you're 100 if, especially if, if Grammarly, if, sorry, if English isn't your first language and you're looking at Grammarly to, and you take 100% of its suggestions, then your article's going to look daft, to use a nice English term. It, it's, you know, you, you can't, it, that's like taking um, the, the WordPress grammar suggestions. Um, sometimes they're just so way off base that I've often actually thought of writing, um, of compiling over a period of time an article and then letting Word, uh, letting Microsoft direct me on all of the changes and make all of the changes that it suggested, and then for a joke, publishing it and seeing what people thought. Probably won't do it, but, but it, it's a thought that amused me. D did you ever uh, read? Did you ever read George Orwell's essay, Politics and the English Language? I think I read that. Remember, uh, he, he, he talked, year, he, so, but I can't remember it. Well, he he quoted a passage from the I think it was from the Song of uh, Song of Songs. It was one of Solomon's uh, witticisms. Yes, it's, it's this famous passage from the King James version of the Bible. I can't remember the exact passage now, but it's just beautifully written, beautiful, elegant uh, piece. Uh, that Solomon said about wisdom, and then he translated that into bureaucraties. He kind of said it the way that a bureaucrat would say it, <laughs> and it was it was uh, de deadly. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can take something that's great and, t and make it worse yeah. by following every suggestion or by um, dumbing down the English yeah. and yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, there, there's a lot of leeway in the English language, yeah. so you can do all sorts of things. Uh, you should definitely choose the better ones, and you know, make whatever you say chatty. Um, you use story or or just be yourself, but you have to be personal. You you have to inject something of yourself into it. I mentioned it before. It, it bears saying again and again. Um, and and then also you have to know that there isn't a single rule that, that can't be broken at times within reason, as long as you're not doing anything really bad when you're breaking it. So just because people say that you should write a thousand words or more in every article, if you only have, if, if a subject is narrow, and if you can get a point across in 500 words, maybe even less, then don't waffle. You know, waffling is for the spoken language. Waffling is for when you're with your friends or when we're having this interview. Uh, waffling isn't for articles, for the written word. So 
you know, it is the spoken, it is the, a better form of your spoken mannerisms. Um, and never, never say more just for the sake of saying it. You, you get your point across, you illustrate it, you prove everything that's necessary. And when you're done with that, if you find that you've got 400 words, you've got two choices. You either broaden your topic or you stop at 400 words. Break the rule. Right. Any other best practices? I'm sure I could come up with others. Um, well, I mean, things that I've already mentioned, really. Things that just knowing your audience and writing to them. Um, speaking from trust, from knowledge. Don't speak just for the sake of it. Don't, don't, don't pick up an article that you've known nothing about. Don't, don't pick up on a subject that, that you've known nothing about and then... Um, and then start writing to an experienced audience. Write from your passion. That's one thing that, that definitely, if you're passionate about something, and if something has been just itching to get out of you, let it out. Let your fingers start doing their magic. You know, even, even if you don't even know how it's going to end up, you've got something there. You, you don't know how it's going to end, but there's something just bursting to come out of you. Let your fingers do something. If that's the type of writer you are, then just start typing and see what happens. And you can change it as you go. You can, you can get new ideas as you go. And the enthusiasm, I'm sure, comes through in the writing when you write from passion instead of from need. That brings me to my final question, Andy, and that is, uh, what advice would you have for someone who's a brand new uh, wannabe blogger on how they can get started? What, what advice would you have? Uh, you, you start off by being, you start small. Um, don't have great expectations that you're going to have uh, a zillion shares or, or huge um, interaction, you're writing for fun. You're starting off writing for yourself. And if you can find an audience for that, then do so. You don't, only, don't only start with a blog and expect people to come to you. This has been said many times, but, but go on social media, write different types of content. Write the, you know, write a little tweet, write a, um, a fairly short form uh, Facebook post, just write different things for different people. But, but ultimately, it's what you want to write. And if you're enjoying what you're doing, it will show. Um, and just know that if you aren't enjoying it, it will also show. Writing that was a chore looks like it was a chore, and it's a chore to read it. So if, you, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, then I don't think that you, you're going to have a very, very hard time gaining an audience. Right. That's, um, you know... No huge expectations, but, but, you know, right, you go after, you've heard all the talk about influencers, by all means, see what they're saying, by all means, comment on them, don't expect the world, that whole influencer marketing thing, you know, if, if everyone did it, then could it really work, the, all of a sudden, every influencer is going to be bogged down with 5,000 people who they are going to interact with and, and care for their budding career. It's not going to happen. So, you know, always do things right. Do things organically. Um, if you nurture your relationships, then they're real. If you force them, then you're forcing people away and just 
just show that you're happy to be doing what you're doing. Right. So, Andy, could you take a couple of minutes and let our audience know about Curati, uh, your firm, uh, what it is you folks do, and how people can get hold of you, get in touch? Okay, well, I'm sure this will only be a couple of minutes, but um, to, to start from the beginning, we started off, the, the whole project started with Jan Gordon, the founder and CEO's need to learn about digital transformation. Um, she just began reading articles because she wanted to know what was going on. She, there were so many things changing and she wanted to keep pace with it that uh, it, it, it all started off from her need. And first she started tweeting um, and then she, uh, then she discovered Scoop It and she started curating the various articles and Yes, some ag aggregation also, not just straight curation, pulling the salient points, that whole second level communication thing. She started doing that and then it took a couple of years, but uh, using the tagline editors of chaos, which meant bringing, um, making sense of all of the change. That's when Curati was born. And initially, Jan thought that the audience would be beginners. And she was surprised when respected leaders started sharing the articles. Um, and then she was even more surprised when some of those people started coming and asking for ghostwriting work for respected publications, <clears throat> pardon me, and organizations. They started coming to Curati, you know, ghostwrite for us. And this was never anything <clears throat> that was an expected path, it came to us, and we did it. Um, and and it's, a, it, it's really a testament to building things organically and, and not having uh, a, a firm thought in your mind about how things must go because everything changes. The audience changed, we listened, and... And, and, and that's how that's how that part of our audience started. But then. But then we got more inquiries in for guest bloggers and the subject matter changed. So we saw that we're reaching again a different audience and we started changing the content strategy. And from that, we got um, our, we, we got inquiries, our first inquiries for social media management. And then it evolved from that to more integrated digital marketing approaches. And we've built a wonderfully diverse team to handle all of these things. Um, we, we've done competitive analysis reports and, and all of the individual aspects of that, which I don't think I need to go into. Um, and business assessments. Um, Measuring digital presence through messaging and articles and engagement and video and calls to action and, and sales funnels. Um, and then by understanding the client's industries, we've, we've been able to put together these marketing campaigns. So uh, and all of this has happened through listening. We, we started off with ghostwriting and now we have moved to integrated marketing programs for our clients and still we remain vigilant and we're, we're always looking at the trends and um, the, the changing needs of the marketplace and how our audience adapts and if they come to us with a surprise we're open we, we're always getting the, the the simple contact us emails and some of them do surprise us um, nothing ever stands still, and so we can't stand still either. We can't rest on our laurels here. And um, just just to close, if all of this sounds good, and if someone is, if people are interested in learning more about their own audiences, learning more about how they can evolve their audience, evolve their business, evolve their digital strategy then you can email us please at info at curati.com c-u-r-a-t-t-i 
info at curati.com. We would love to hear from you. Andy, thank you very much. And thank you, Alan. It's been a pleasure. If a little bit nervous at times, it's been a pleasure. You're welcome.